Dzień dobry państwu. Doceniamy, że good morning. Tak wcześniej w taką pogodę. We truly appreciate you that you're here given the early hour and the weather. Uh, hello to everybody who is here in the auditorium and hello to everybody who is joining us online. We are starting the second day of the new Visual Narratives Conference. Before I introduce our panelists, a few uh, organizational remarks. Uh, we will now uh, hear a panel about the essay film. And around 11 o'clock, uh, Agnieszka Sural will also be having a tour, giving a tour of her exhibition. That will be at 11 o'clock um, at the info point. It will take about an hour and a half. For those who wish to join Agnieszka, then we have two uh, VR blocks. Uh, first, a research block, then a more artistic block. Uh, we will be talking quite a bit about VR and augmented reality today. At 5.30, uh, Joanna Zelinska's uh, Human versus Machine Vision, Non-Human Creativity, A Gift of the World, uh, will premiere, uh, followed by a talk uh, by Joanna uh, with regard to networking uh, for those of you who are in Wood this evening uh, we will be having an after party in this very building it's rainy outside but I hope that we can all gather here uh, the after party will start at 8 and we'll hear from a DJ monster um, Oramix and a VJ uh, Michał Szota uh, who has prepared some visualizations. Uh, for those who are joining us uh, from other cities, uh, we invite you to come at least for the second half of the day or for the evening a party. So let's get started on the essay film studio panel. We have quite a lot of guests. We have a foreign speaker, Ariel Avisar, essayist, video lecturer um, from the Stif Steve Tisch School of Film at Tel Aviv University. He is editor-in-chief of In Transition, the Journal of Videographic Film and Moving Image Studies. He also co-edited the plebiscite Best Video Essays. He also runs various workshops and seminars devoted to video criticism. Stanisław Liguziński, video essayist, uh, lecturer and coordinator of research initiatives within the framework of the master's course research in and through cinema at the Dutch Film Academy, a curator and VR a curator, a PhD candidate at the Audiovisual Arts Institute, Jagiellonian University. He also co-heads the essay film studio at at uh, VN Lab, uh, Michał Matuszewski, film curator, researcher, uh, film essayist, the curator of many film events, including retrospectives at the uh, Zamek Gwiazdowski Center uh, for Modern Art, a co-curator of uh, Polish experimental films and of short waves, also deputy director of the film of the essay film studio. Also with us is Kuba Mikurda, who needs no introduction here. Uh, director, film researcher, the head of the Art Studies Institute and the film essay studio here at the Wuch Film School. He made his debut uh, with Love Express, Love Express, the case of Valerian Borovczyk, 
Uh, he recently shot the escape um, to the moon. Uh, so these are the people here are here with us. Online, we are also joined by uh, Dana Linsen, film critic, philosopher. She currently works at Film Forward in the Netherlands. She is a film critic with uh, a very rich experience and many achievements. I think that is it from me. Uh, you are about to hear uh, some interesting lectures and discussions, and I will see you later. I give the floor to Staszek. Thanks a lot, Anna, for this great introduction. Czy mogłem prosić o prezentację na moment? Jak tutaj już się przełączam. Could I ask, could I have the presentation? Computer. Yeah, Anna was just saying um, how even the program of this conference is hard to navigate because there is so many things happening simultaneously all at once. And I think our world is getting increasingly complicated as well. And this is something that uh, Felix Stadler was addressing yesterday in his talk uh, about immersion in the world. And I think we want to talk about uh, similar things, but our mode of engagement with this uh, increasingly complex reality is uh, video essay and different essayistic modes of, of production. Um, and uh, without further ado, before I elaborate on that theme a little bit more, I would like to show a little um, video essay made by Ardia Visar, our guest, uh, within the Essay Film Studio, within the working group of the Essay Film Studio that um, Ardia was a member of, uh, which I think addresses that theme beautifully and also adheres to Ariel's uh, research, um, which he will elaborate on uh, in a second. So let's watch the little clip. Can we kill the lights? So um, I still wanted to just 
Uh, all right, I'll say a few words about this. Um, so this was uh, a little fragment, uh, one of a few little fragments that we produced uh, as part of the SA Film Studio uh, meetings. Um, my project, the one that I've been developing in parts, is based on my uh, uh, master's thesis, thesis uh, project, which was almost a de decade ago now. Uh, and it deals with post-9-11 catastrophic series in uh, American television series. You might have recognized a couple of them. Um, and the, it started with the image of the, the conspiracy board, uh, which is a very uh, familiar trope in, in American film and television. And I was looking at these uh, series, these sort of investigative uh, narratives. Um, um, it's always against some sort of existential threat, some sort of a terrorist attack or alien invasion or um, some other sort of a global catastrophe. Um, which, in, as I saw it, is only emblematic of uh, existential, broader existential threats in the network society, in contemporary postmodern society that's very uh, complex and uh, rhythmatic and uh, networked and elusive. So it's mostly an epistemological challenge, uh, some sort of um, attempt to connect the dots, which is the title of the project, um, some sort of uh, attempt to make a uh, chaos into something that's a little more coherent, at least visually. Um, so this specific uh, exercise following uh, a session with uh, Catherine Grant um, is based on what is called the epigraphic mode, where you choose a quote from a theoretical text and try to uh, incorporate it in some sort of dynamic way with um, audiovisual elements. So that's uh, what's behind this little fragment. I just, I guess I just wanted, before I hand over the microphone uh, again to Ariel, and uh, he'll tell us a little bit about the field and uh, how video essays are being made at the moment, I just wanted to cast some light on the um, SA Film Studio itself. Um, we, me and Kuba, we've been both uh, working with this idea of the SA stick for over a decade right now, and I think we've seen this spark of interest in the last couple of years, and there's a huge emergence of different media practices that uh, pertain to this notion of the essayistic, and they are mainly re realized in a couple of different fields. So it's uh, in, the, in the context of academia, in the context of film criticism, on YouTube, uh, but also in arts and in cinema. Uh, so we were really curious to see why there's this very particular historical moment right now that, uh, that we observe this, uh, this uh, growth of interest and also how we can encapsulate all those practices um, in, in what way, because essay is um, this heterogeneous term by itself. It's very hard to pinpoint what an essay could be. So we have to, del we have to delineate somehow uh, certain objectives for ourselves when we're going into this um, uh, task of setting up the, the studio um, here as a part of the VN Lab. And I think going into that task, we, we made a couple of assumptions. First of all, uh, we assumed that we're going back to the etymological uh, root of the word essay, so we treat it as an attempt. Uh, we forget that it has a history in film. Uh, the, the essay film has its own history and its own acknowledged uh, forms and formats. Uh, you know, we all know Chris Marker, Anis Varda, like all these established uh, filmmakers. But we try to look at it as a mode of practice-based research. So how can we use the medium, uh, audiovisual medium, as uh, Felix was actually calling for yesterday? How can we develop this new aesthetic of engagement with media reality that surrounds us, that is actually inherently rooted in the medium itself, in audiovisual uh, mode of practice? So we didn't treat it as a genre, but as a, as a uh, method. And so then we felt, then, okay. And, and also as a sort of attitude, yep. something larger than, uh, than just uh, f film production, but a basic attitude of dealing with the world, right? So, so it's even on this existential level or cognitive level. Yeah, thank you uh, for Sorry, operating. Just, no, it's, uh, uh, it was uh, very necessary. But uh, going back to Ariel's uh, video as well, we've seen this associative mode of thinking. So those people try to 
uh, escape the impossibility of talking about the complex issues that they are facing by using a different media strategy for making sense out of it. And instead, they're using this associative mode of thinking of arranging things on the, uh, on the blackboard. So then we felt if it's an attempt, if it's all about the process of discovery, if it is about research indeed, then what conditions do we need to create for the makers to be able to actually engage in this kind of practices? And if we speak about the practice that we've been engaged in uh, in the studio as a practice-based research, then of course our research was about facilitation. So about creating a space and asking ourselves a question, how to create a space which enables essayistic practices uh, to, uh, to happen. And this is what we wrote in our manifesto and this kind of opening statement that such objectives require specific means and conditions of production that provide uh, makers with the most precious of resources, the time and space to make the attempts. Um, so this is why I wanted to dedicate this panel today to the conversation with people who also in their own right make different spaces for video essays to flourish and for essayistic works to flourish. Um, and I'm very happy that um, uh, you're all here. Dana, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, and I wanted to address uh, also uh, another issue, which is the gender disparity of this uh, panel. Uh, we are very sorry for that. This was not an intention. Uh, there was also supposed to be Sana Yehu with us, but unfortunately some things uh, didn't click uh, and she wasn't able to, to come. So uh, we are very sorry uh, for that. Uh, These were, this were the assumptions uh, that we've made going into this, um, this journey. And I just wanted to very briefly summarize what the uh, essay film studio consisted of. We started before the pandemic uh, and the idea, the first initial idea for the, for the studio was a little bit different. We were supposed to be meeting here uh, in Wuch, uh, having seminars in person, uh, you know, like trying to engage in these practices of co-creation, inviting makers to come here, make essayistic forms here in Wuj. And to a degree, it did happen twice. So we were able to, uh, to host Amri Er and then afterwards Mika Bal, um, a fantastic narratologist and scholar who's made her essay uh, here in which as well. But then the pandemic hit. And on one hand, it was a problem. On the other hand, it presented us with a great opportunity because as we just said, we felt that there is this urgency and there is a momentum where you know, you could see the growth of essays all around the world in all these different disciplines and fields. So we issued an international call uh, and the response was overwhelming. Uh, we, we had uh, really a great interest in those seminars and in the, pre in the uh, activities of the studio. Um, and like 300 people from all over the world. Uh, yeah, basically. yeah, so it, it was, um, you, you could see- No one you, from Australia though. Yeah, no one from Australia, but we have pe people from Africa, from uh, Latin America, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, pretty much, you know, you name it, um, they've been there. Um, so it confirmed our suspicion that there is a momentum and there is a need. Um, I'm going to ask Ariel in a second if it worked out, mm -hmm. but is, there is a need for spaces like this. So, so for spaces that actually provide you with uh, those um, conditions of co-creation, <laughs> feedback, uh, community, time, space, and the expertise of, uh, of everyone that we've invited to help us on this journey. Because we felt, okay, if it's an attempt, if it's an experimental practice, then we want to learn more. We want to sit down together. We actually want to discuss, we want to engage in a conversation with makers that uh, have been producing forms like this before, are producing them currently, and producing them in all those different um, areas and circumstances. So art, film, uh, and online um, video essay practices. So here, what you see on screen is actually people that uh, have been running our seminars uh, throughout the last two years. And for the seminars, we created a working group that Ariel was a part of, which was 12 selected uh, makers uh, who've been actually doing this kind of uh, attempts and essays and uh, different uh, experiments, uh, filmmaking experiments, as you could have seen uh, in the beginning uh, from Ariel. And I'm just going to very briefly uh, say who that was and what we were looking at, because that's, re that's related to the publication that is going to be coming up, um, hopefully, in October. Uh, so uh, we have Ayal Sivan, uh, Israeli uh, documentary uh, filmmaker, whose focus was mostly on subjectivity and situatedness of knowledge. So this is something that Fel Felix was also talking about. So we were trying to look at the essay as this kind of subjective, radically subjective uh, form of enunciation, but also the one that tries to situate the knowledge and really reflect on the positions from which the, the makers are speaking. Then we had Katrin Grant, 
who spoke about the essay as this tool of defamiliarization, so how we can, how we can put a medium between ourselves and the world to look at the world differently, to suddenly perceive the objects that we just assume we know what they are and actually deconstruct them and analyze them. Then we had Johann Grimond Press, uh, with whom we were talking about the political engagement of such work and polit political ramifications of, of this kind of uh, media interventions. And subtext, right? Like the and the subtext. How you can actually uh, disclose something that was hidden in your basic material by way of editing or of, uh, sort of putting side by side with a different kind of material. Yeah, and uh, Johan uh, um, is known to the, to the Polish public as well. He's, uh, he's a fantastic um, found footage compilation filmmaker. Then James and Kenneth Wilkins, whose work you could have seen also in uh, yesterday's set of the essays that we selected uh, for you, who's, uh, who's working in more of a gallery um, circumstances, but also screening his works in, uh, in uh, film festivals. And with him, we were looking at this kind of media archeology span perspective. What, what can we learn through the aesthetic uh, practices about the medium itself and its um, uh, material ramifications? Then of course, Laura Malvi, uh, and with Laura, we spoke about um, several things, but actually I think the most important one was also the historical context of media practices at the time and how they give uh, rise basically to uh, those new formats of, of essayistic, uh, which uh, Laura has herself, like she actually denounces the term uh, film essayist when it comes to her because she says it was a very different time uh, and with her practices, with 16 millimeter tapes, she was responding to a very different modes of filmmaking. And what she recognizes right now is a certain continuity of, of those critical practices, but she says because of the media circumstances, it's a very different uh, practice. Then Kevin B. Lee, um, a very well-known video essayist with whom we were talking about uh, desktop documentaries, so how to look at your own desktop as an actual mode of production for which we actually conduct research on an everyday basis and how we can replicate that in, in the essayistic. Uh, then Charlie Shackleton, uh, who've been this multi who's like this multi-model essayist. You've seen his essay on TikTok yesterday in the program as well. Uh, he's using mobile phones, he's using VR, and he's using all these um, um, multi-model practices uh, to engage with the essayistic. And the last seminar of this season was with Asaf Gruber, and we were looking at the uh, institutional ramifications of uh, what, it, what it means to produce within a certain institution. And this is going to be somehow, uh, I hope, uh, continued today, that, that uh, form of discussion. And still in September, we hope to host uh, Chloe garliber Lenné, whose other film, Forensicness, uh, we could have seen uh, yesterday. So beside the working group and all the seminars that we've had with those people trying to like put finger on what the essayistic is right now, what, what kind of gestures, what kind of make, filmmaking gestures are constituting that field of the, of the essay currently, uh, we also launched uh, a grant. Uh, and uh, for that, we issued an open call. Uh, we also received a lot of applications, out of which we chose five projects uh, that were financed by the studio, and then they are currently being realized. One of them has been finished. Uh, it is a movie called Subtotals by Mohamed Reza Farzad. We actually have a producer of the film, uh, Afsun, uh, here in the audience uh, today. Uh, and it premiered at um, Berlinale Forum Expanded, and it's currently touring uh, the festival, and we are wait, waiting for the four more projects that hopefully will be coming at the end of October, so please stay tuned. And on top of that, uh, we felt that one of the most interesting uh, applications of the essayistic lately is to re-archive the archives. So how can we actually animate the archives that we have, that uh, we are sitting on, through those essayistic practices and make them relevant again? So we launched an uh, archival group uh, of the studio, uh, which is working with the archive of the uh, Educational Film Archive, UFO, Wytwórnia Filmów Oświatowych uh, in Łódź. And it's an international group of makers as well who is diving into this uh, repository and, and making essayistic works out of um, those collections. So it's enough about the studio. It was a lengthy intro anyway. Uh, so I would like to uh, hand over the microphone to Ariel Avisar because uh, beside everything that was mentioned, Ariel is also compiling every year a list of uh, co-editing, uh, the, the list of best video essays for Sight and Sound magazine. 
uh, and he's been doing it since 2019, if I'm correct. So uh, there is already a kind of a plethora of data that he's gathered, and I would like to ask him to summarize a little bit how the field looks like from the perspective of the editor of that uh, annual poll. Thank you. Um, we'll get back to discussing the, the studio sessions uh, later, but for now, I'll just a very brief overview of the video essay world as it currently is developing. Um, show of hands, I'm guessing, uh, who, who, how many people here watch video essays regularly? Not a lot, huh? Or maybe you're not sure what I'm referring to when I say video essay. Uh, it's a very problematic term. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, there are a lot of video essays that are not essayistic. There are some video essays that aren't even videos. Um, but uh, if I had to draw like a very generalizing uh, picture, um, video essays can be found operating in three distinct, though interrelated, spheres. There's some overlap. But if I had to describe them in very broad terms, it would be the uh, popular um, uh, sphere, the academic sphere, and the uh, uh, art film, um, or avant-garde, or experimental, or essay film sphere. Uh, what is the difference between a video essay and an essay film? That's a good question with many different answers. Again, these are very uh, fluid categories. Uh, but the, uh, the popular online field is where you find and this is what most people think of when they think of video essays, YouTube video essays, popular. Uh, sometimes uh, you have uh, very successful YouTubers with um, tens of millions of followers who regularly produce video essays or audiovisual essays um, on various topics. Um, and they operate uh, primarily in, in YouTube and other social media uh, platforms. They have, uh, there's Nebula, which is a, um, a streaming service that a few YouTubers and video essays have gathered together to get subscribers to as a, a more feasible financial uh, mode of operation. And it's uh, very recently also is starting to make its way into more um, 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 mainstream platforms. Netflix had a series uh, produced by David Fincher, which is called Voir, if you've heard of it. Um, if you haven't heard of it, you're, you're not missing much. Uh, it was a series of, uh, they defined them as vis visual essays about cinema, um, but it's very clearly a response to the popular, the popularity of uh, YouTube video essays that uh, Netflix is trying to uh, piggyback on. Piggyback, that's a very recent uh, Netflix reference, if anyone's seen uh, Stranger Things, never mind. Uh, then there's the uh, academic scholarly field. Um, and this uh, op operates primarily on Vimeo uh, and, and not YouTube. There are several reasons for this, but we won't go into that right now. Um, and the name uh, adopted by the academic community is uh, Videographic Media Studies or Videographic Criticism. Um, Academic video essays are circulated in uh, peer-reviewed journals such as In Transition and Tech Marine and others. There are more and more uh, academic journals that either incorporate video essays or are dedicated solely to video essays. And they're also uh, presented as part of academic conferences and uh, syllabuses. And this is obviously a much smaller sphere when compared to the uh, immense YouTube community. Um, and over here, the, the the basic idea of videographic practices is to use video editing not just as a way to express your ideas and arguments, but primarily as a way to explore the materials you're working with. Another way to engage with audiovisual media in order to reflect on it in ways that perhaps traditional thinking and scholarly writing uh, isn't capable of. Um, so just as a very specific example, uh, if my uh, Connecting the Dots project deals with chaos and fragmentation and the attempt to bind together disparate elements into a coherent whole, I could write about it as I did in my master's dissertation, but that uh, explanation is very linear and plain and simple. You, know, you can follow the argument as you're supposed to in a scholarly paper in a very, very easy way, simple way to follow. And the video attempts to replicate that sense of attempting to make sense uh, out of chaos into the viewing experience uh, of the video itself. So the argument itself is presented in a more fragment, fragmented sort of way. Uh, so that's just a very little example. 
Um, and then you have the third sphere where you have video essays or essay films or whatever you want to call it in uh, festivals all around the world. More and more festivals incorporate video essay uh, sections and programs and awards into their uh, programs. And uh, you can also find some video essay work displayed as museum installations. Um, uh, yeah, so again, very broadly speaking, these are the three spheres in which uh, video essays are produced and circulated. And there are, again, there is some overlap and there's also a lot of uh, differentiation. Um, I think most people in the world and most uh, YouTube-based video essays would not call most of what the academic world produces video essays. And conversely, a lot of the academics would consider a lot of what is labeled as a video essay on YouTube and say that that's not a video essay. So again, this is a very contested term, which is fine. Um, but it just speaks to the kind of uh, diversity of, of operation. Um, I'll say a bit more about these spheres uh, later, but as, uh, as Stan mentioned, I've been co-editing the uh, Sight and Sound Best Video Essays uh, poll for the past three years. Show of hands, how many people check out this poll? A couple, good, all right. Uh, it's not, uh, Sight and Sound does a lot of end of year polls, the best films of the year, the best TV series of the year. Um, but this poll is a lot less uh, perhaps useful than those other polls because it doesn't give you a list of like these are the 20 best or even the 100 best. It's just a gigantic list of video essays, again, whatever that means, that our contributors have decided to spotlight. We don't have like a hierarchical list or anything. So it's usually between 150 to sometimes almost 200 video essays produced that year uh, that are worthy of note. We're not trying to give out awards for the best one, that's just the name of the poll. But it's a, it's a great platform to get to know a lot of work. Um, and just to give you an idea of how fluid the definition video essay really is, uh, just in the past three years when I've been editing it, we've been getting obviously a lot of uh, online video essays, but also short form and feature length documentary films and essay films, uh, some television series, um, some museum installations, a live performance, uh, a Kanye West music video, a Twitter thread, and these were all proposed as some of the best video essays produced in the last few years. So again, the term means a lot of different things. Um, and since I'm a kind of a statistics uh, lover, I'm always uh, compiling numbers and seeing what kind of trends we can see. As much as you can point out any trends from just three years, but uh, I'll just briefly present some uh, pie charts. I think I haven't made pie charts since high school probably, so this was fun. Uh, let's start with the contributors uh, of the last few, three years. And as you can see, the uh, academic world is overrepresented uh, in the contributors uh, as opposed to its size in the real world, while the popular YouTube sphere is criminally underrepresented. We've been actively trying to do something about that. It doesn't always work. We've had some years fared better and some years uh, more than others. Um, so this is one thing to say about the contributors. Uh, they are mostly uh, American or European, um, which is something else to try to work on. And uh, this is not great, but still better than, the, than this panel somehow. Uh, again, this is something we're actively trying to work towards. For example, inviting more uh, female contributors than male contributors, and still we get response more from male contributors. Perhaps there's, perhaps uh, men feel more attracted to uh, rating and polling. I don't know. We're, again, working, working on this. Uh, anyway, so if I look at the results of the last three years and the the contributors, uh, the, the, the previous three uh, um, uh, charts explain a lot of the results, the results that you can see here. So we have a lot of work from the US and the UK, and then the rest of Europe, and then the rest of the world. Um, 
And there are obviously a lot more uh, video essays on YouTube than Vimeo, and they get a lot more uh, exposure and views than the Vimeo uh, works. But again, since the academic world is highly overrepresented in the contributor list, this is these are the results. And we saw a, a direct correlation in a specific year where we had a lot more um, YouTube video essays contributing to the poll, there were a lot more uh, YouTube video essays selected for the poll. So it's almost like these two different arenas that are not detached from one another, but it does speak to some sort of myopia, I guess, in each field. Um, and again, since it's a, a mostly academics, uh, film uh, as an object of study is uh, the, by far the most uh, prevalent. Um, in YouTube video essays, you can find anything from uh, philosophy to politics to uh, gender, gender relations to anything else. It doesn't have to be about film or television, but videographic criticism obviously is more focused on film uh, above anything else. Uh, we did see perhaps, for example, in the 2020 poll and the year of the pandemic, there were a lot of video essays related to the pandemic and to lockdown life and also to the Black Lives Matter movement. So you can see these trends in specific years about topics that seem to be, uh, to attract more engagement. Um, this is another thing to work on um, that is not great. Uh, one positive uh, sort of trend, if you look, uh, if you look at the um, uh, gender relations uh, year by year, so this was the 2019 poll and the 2020 poll and the 2021 poll. So at least in this regard, we're on the right track, even though in terms of the contributors' gender, we could uh, be doing a better job. Um, right, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Ariel. Uh, you created a beautiful leeway, I think, uh, for me to uh, hand over the microphone to Dana, like metaphorically speaking, the microphone. <laughs> Uh, because there's been, I think, uh, Dana is really among the, the, the early adapters and one of the first people who actually created, actively started creating spaces for this, uh, um, for this, this kind of uh, filmmaking format to, to flourish. And um, first as an, if, if I'm not, if I'm, maybe I'm getting the chronology wrong, but uh, first as an editor-in-chief still of Film Grant, uh, you actually commissioned Adrian Martin and, and Christine alvarez Ropes to actually contribute in an audiovisual form to a, to a film critical uh, magazine that, that you were uh, running. But then, of course, as a head, um, uh, co-creating with uh, Jan-Peter Ecker um, at the Critics' Choice of uh, IFFR. And what um, Ariel was mentioning in terms of diversity of those formats, he was mentioning installations, he was mentioning, uh, you know, straightforward videos. This is something I think that Critics' Choice was also excelling at in terms of the, you know, how imaginative you were in, the, in, the, in that approach, but also how actively I think Critics' Choice program was um, initiating those, those works. So like some of them were actually projects that maybe were adapted towards, uh, towards Critics' Choice, but many of them were actually inspired by uh, your direct uh, commission. Uh, so if you could, Dana, tell us a little bit uh, coming from criti film criticism, also uh, being now a maker of video essays, but initially, uh, let's say, a commissioner or a, or a curator, what sparked your interest? And um, and yeah, what was what was the whole idea behind Critics' Choice? Wow! Wow! wow. Many, wow. Questions. Many questions. First of all, first of all um, thank, um, you, thank you for having you me, for having uh, me uh, as a um, as, as a speaker as or a part speaker of this, or panel. Part of this um, panel. I'm really um, honored. I'm really honored. Um, um, it's nice to it's nice see to you all. See you all. Um, I'm sorry, we have a bit as, of a reverb. As, just just a second, Donna. Uh, sorry yeah, to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, let me. And now? Another try? Another try? Is this better now? Is this better now? No, no. Before Dana comes back, then maybe I could uh, ask Kuba, uh, because um, what Ariel was mentioning, he was mostly mentioning those fields of, of academia, of, uh, of YouTube. Uh, but there is, of course, also kind of like the surge of video essay, or not the video essay, but essayistic practices also in filmmaking, I would say. And I think you're one of the really good examples um, of this. But when I speak about a certain conditions that need to be provided in order to engage with the material in the essayistic manner, 
I'm wondering, like, how far does a regular production cycle of a movie uh, allows for this kind of practices? And also, now you also have, because you you are also now engaged in actually making an essay work within the studio that is based on Solaris. Then, how do, would you compare those two different modes of production? Like, first of all, working on your film, uh, Escape from from the Silver Globe, and uh, now the works on on Solaris Mon Amour. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep looking for solution, and I'm, I just ask Kuba a question, so I'm gonna let him answer, and in the meantime, I'm gonna try to do everything in my power to to make it work. Kuba, can you can you yeah, I mean, please respond? It's a very important question, uh, the question about the conditions of possibility of such practices, because basically, as you as you mentioned, I mean, it's uh, it's almost impossible in the sort of professional kind of mode. I mean, because of, uh, for, for for one reason. Uh, f uh, it's because if you apply for money uh, for your project, you need to provide a script, and it needs to be uh, quite often quite a long script, uh, even if, when it comes to experimental documentaries. And uh, f basically, it's like an oxymoron, like a paradox. Like you want to make an experiment, and you want, and you need to actually provide a script in advance. Um, f uh, so basically, obviously. There is a possibility of going around it by simulating what you f f expect to achieve, right? And to write it down on paper. And obviously, if, if you can treat it as a simulation, but at the same time, uh, this whole process is uh, such, a, uh, such a strong kind of uh, mm, dispositive, or whatever you want to call it, that uh, actually, once you have it on paper, everyone, even if you say, uh, even if you f are very clear that it's just an attempt, it's just a simulation, uh, everybody in the process uh, gets sort of attached to this uh, paperwork and then uh, f start to uh, mm, f refer your experiment to what was on paper, uh, which basically, even you yourself, you know, sometimes feel like you're obliged to, to, f to follow what you uh, wrote on paper at this very early, early stage. So basically this kind of essayistic approach of uh, this kind of situation when, when, you, when you come to some kind of uh, fund giver or fund, like film fund, and you say, I don't really know what I want to do. I have some ideas. I don't know what the format will be. I don't know what it will be about. Just give me the money and let me work, right? I mean, it doesn't happen uh, for that often. Because uh, for, uh, for in this very situation, in this very context, we had I had an opportunity to actually work like this uh, for in the framework of our of our grant and to sort of navigate through an archive without a clear goal at the very beginning. And now it's sort of getting uh, for getting together. All of uh, us, <laughs> well, even today, Michal actually asked me. So, uh, what is the format actually? Uh, for how long should it be? You know. Uh, and I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it, we, we will see. We will see when it comes. Uh, for, it will be as long as it, ha it has to be. But I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, for comfort to have this uh, for, for possibility to, to, to think about it like, for, like this. Uh, so, so yes, and I think y y we need to sort of re rethink the frameworks of financing this kind of documentaries, right? Because it, it, it needs a, a major kind of shift uh, for if you want to provide these conditions of possibility. Um, the other thing is, and, and I wanted to, to, to say it, I wanted to address it here because we're at the film school and actually Polish film school in Łódź is the very first art school in Poland and I don't know, maybe even in Eastern Europe that allows for video essays to be produced as your master's thesis. And um, uh, I, now I'm sort of post, but it was my idea and I put a lot of effort to, to make it happen. Uh, f uh, and we had uh, a number of, uh, of uh, legal consultations, if it's actually possible, but it is possible. And uh, f uh, f uh, the first master's video essay was uh, successfully uh, defended a month ago, uh, f uh, which is great. And there are already two or three on the way. So f uh, I think the next step that we need to do is to f uh, provide our students with a sort of curriculum or way of teaching how to produce this kind of academic video essays in the context of this very school. Uh, but I'm really happy that it was the place and that f f actually the uh, 
um, the, uh, for the heads of departments uh, were very much supportive uh, for in this respect. Uh, so hopefully every year we'll have two or three or five great video essays produced, produced here. Uh, for, and it will open some kind of new uh, video essayistic wave in, for, in Poland. Uh, for, so yes, I mean, I'm for comparing this to projects, just to, to, to summarize it very quickly, I mean, yeah, I mean, for, Zhuavsky was a much more traditional documentary, and we applied for money from all those typical kind of funds. Uh, for, but, but yeah, it was like for, for, I had to follow some kind of pre-written ideas. And here, I mean, it's the most exciting uh, process I've ever sort of experienced because we're really going after the material and we're discovering and we're reshaping and we're reframing the, for the, the film all the time, uh, for, which is, I guess, what the essay is all about. And where do you think that difference comes from? Like, what modes of, of inquiry does it enable that wouldn't be accessible otherwise? Yeah, I, I think it's this kind of hand-on approach that you actually have uh, think with the material itself. Uh, because if you need to write something on paper, it's usually before you start some kind of uh, uh, in-depth research, uh, for before you definitely before you start editing, right? So for, hmm, now we have a reverb here. Mm -hmm. that, that wasn't the solution done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, for, so, so, so basically you sort of, you, 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 you need to create your film uh, for, with just ideas, not the materials itself. Obviously, you have some materials at the very beginning that you can embed in the, in the script. But here, I mean, the very difference comes from the fact that mm, if, uh, we have a basic framework of where we want to get. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if, uh, we're trying to listen and look very closely to the materials itself and let them reshape our uh, for conditions, uh, even like for, 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 to a great length, actually, sometimes the structure of the film, because we found something that actually will work on screen much better than we, whatever we, we could imagine before. So yeah, I mean, uh, for, mm, there is a difference. Uh, you, you could say that uh, you often use the word tactile and this kind of tact tactile engagement with the material. Uh, definitely this kind of engagement is much more tactile because it allows you to yeah, be very close to the material, but at the same time, tactile means that you don't have like overall perspective, you sort of touch things and you, 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 you go with them, you explore them. Uh, for sometimes you will burn, <laughs> sometimes you will find something interesting, right? Uh, for, but at the same time, yeah, I, 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 on the other hand, I would say that this kind of work is much more physical for me then beforehand, I mean, for, for the work on Zhivovsky was, was much more intellectual, and, and here there's something very clearly physical about the, about the process. I don't know how to call it, but maybe I will write about it some time in the future. Yeah. And you mentioned as well that uh, Wood Film School students are now allowed to, to submit their thesis in the video as a form. There hasn't been so many uh, so far. Yeah. But Ariel is someone who's actually been using a video essay also in education uh, quite extensively in your courses. So if you could maybe share a little bit your experiences with that with us, like how do your students respond to that? And is it only what Charlie Shackleton recognized in the TikTok video that we've seen yesterday, that there is different media interfaces that they are used to be working with, so it comes nat more naturally maybe to them to use uh, some of those tools uh, as the mode of expression but does it go beyond that as well? Is there something that you think it enables them to do in terms of their engagement with media material uh, that, let's say, the classical uh, conceptual uh, written approach wouldn't enable? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I actually got started with video essays as, as a teacher. I would use them in class all the time because they're a very useful way to get your ideas across. Like if you're teaching film aesthetics, you can very easily show a three-minute video essay that uh, kind of uh, um, showcases like 30 different examples of a particular use of camera or color or something like that. So that was the first thing, as a teaching aid before I ever started making them. But then when I got into the videographic uh, practices, well, um, I started a course, I have a, a videographic criticism course uh, that's purely videographic. And I have to say that it's one of the most, it's been one of the most rewarding uh, teaching experiences uh, I've ever had. Um, students really respond to it. 
and it doesn't matter whether it's students who know how to edit or even almost every year I get at least a couple of students who've never touched an editing software in their life and they just catch right on and produce excellent work. Um, and it's uh, the course that I've seen students um, engage with in the most enthusiastic way uh, possible. Um, there's something very intimate about this mode of engagement with materials, um, as opposed to you know just uh, watching a film and, and then thinking about it and maybe reading some papers and to actually play around with it uh, in the editing software. It opens up an entirely an entire new world and a way of uh, eff effectively engaging with with the material. Um, that's just and and they produce. It's one of the most demanding courses perhaps the most demanding course uh, that we have at my department because they have to make, uh, they, they have to submit um, editing exercises every single week and other ex smaller exercises bes besides those. And they just do everything and more than they need to. They really spend a lot of time on this course. Um, and a lot of them have also uh, carried these um, ideas into other courses and uh, attempt whenever teachers allow it to incorporate videographic co courses and uh, practices in non-videographic and traditional uh, courses. Um, we unfortunately don't have the option to uh, do a videographic master's. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a PhD uh, student right now. I would have loved to have uh, use videographic practice in that, but uh, it's, it's a new field. I mean, in Israel, it's a very new field. I'm basically building it from the ground up in the recent years. Um, but I, I really can't recommend it enough for, for teachers and students. It's, uh, and, and it's also the sort of thing that you can't really understand the appeal until you actually try it. I mean, if I just tell you about it and how great it is, maybe it sounds good, but, but until you sit down and just edit something, it's hard to to understand this uh, this new mode of of thinking. Yes, can you hear I'm me interested now? Interesting going back to interested going back to let's say our main topic of the conversation here because we see the disparity. On one hand, there is uh, let's say a, a professional mode of production which comes with its own requirements, uh, which is quite limited in certain ways uh, with relation to works that are more experimental, more, more practice driven. And on the other hand, there is this flourishing practice, uh, but it is a practice that does not uh, have necessarily like a, a lot of resources attached. So there is there is certain limits to the professionalization of it because, as you we also saw from your pie charts, a lot of practitioners are academics because I think their appointment with university allows them in a certain way to to engage with this kind of practices. On the other hand, there are YouTubers who have their kind of own mode mode of uh, monetization. But there seems to be a lack of like a middle ground or a bridge if you want to build up your practice towards something that is a bit more uh, professional or something that is going to make rounds in the festivals. Um, but uh, at the same time, you don't want to adhere to those production requirements that come with, with professional film production, which is also guarded by the way who can apply. With Polish Film Institute, for example, you have to be a certified director in order to, to, uh, to apply for, for funds like this. Or at least pretend you are. Yeah. In my case. So, so from from your perspective, Ariel, as well, I think I want I want to kind of do a detour as well to a question: What was in it for you when you applied to the to the essay film studio and why you were interested? But also, like, do you see any bridges or like you know like those those middle spaces that allow for for bigger projects and for for a certain professionalization of of the of the production? Yeah, I think no, yeah, maybe we could. Oh, yeah, uh, I think Dana, Dana might be back. <laughs> How is I it? Hope so. <laughs> yes, I mean, yes. sound okay now. Yes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're back with us. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> we have applause uh, now coming from the room. Uh, so maybe before, uh, we, before we go to this, uh, maybe we can revert back to the question that I asked Dana. Uh, so, so we can come, kind of come back to the to the beginning. I don't know if you if you still remember uh, Dana, but uh, but I was I was basically yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. So yeah. First of all, thank you for having me, and um, I'm really glad that you managed to solve the uh, the sound. 
Um, so my initial interest in, in video essays actually came from my practice as a critic and an editor-in-chief of Dutch film magazine Filmkrant, um, where I was always looking for new uh, modes of expression, new formats um, and ways to reinvent criticism. So when uh, the video essay kind of became a little bit more of a common practice, um, maybe already 15 years ago, I was trying to look for ways to incorporate it in our editorial practices. Um, the biggest um, problem at that time for us was that we were dealing with new films, so how to get access to new films um, instead of um, a research practice on films that were already available uh, on some form or in some digital format. So that kind of um, became a dead end street. And then we uh, we did some little experiments. Joost Broere uh, of the current film team was one of the people that started to make video essays. And um, then we asked Adrian, um, who we've known from uh, from certain projects that we did before also that had to do with uh, new forms of criticism. And then actually, uh, we spoke with the Rotterdam Film Festival and uh, they asked Jan Pieper and myself to uh, bring the Critics' Choice back and then we said, okay, but that would be the perfect opportunity to work with new films um, and ask the, the, the directors um, to make their, their, their films available for this form of criticism. And since there was no real um, how to say it, practice or corpus or tradition in uh, having uh, video essays or audiovisual criticism about new films, we immediately thought that it would be wise to experiment and not only think about um, the, say, linear filmic format, but also how that could work as, a, as an experience in a room, as a shared experience with a film audience, but also with the filmmakers and from there on we started to experiment actually with non-videographic forms like performances and um, I think the, the knitting experiment of Joanna Pavlova who uh, knitted a scarf as a, as a form of analog uh, data visualization for the film Make Me Up is kind of famous because that left an artifact but not a video essay. Uh, to the world. And from there on, we, we were invited to make video essays for the Vivle Cinema exhibition last year uh, when Rotterdam celebrated its 50th anniversary and collaborated with the I Film Museum. So for the first time, we had video essays um, actually that were made about works that were in the, in the process of being made at the same time. So we had to work with all kinds of different um, materials so we're we're constantly kind of navigating this field how to deal with new works and contribute uh to the to the critical discourse that is uh, happening and not so much maybe to the academic uh discourse luckily we have some funding for this through both the rotterdam film festival and the dutch film fund and um we uh do some sponsoring and fundraising ourselves, so we're able to pay uh, the people we commission video essays. I think that for the last 10 years, John Peter and I commissioned around 50 video essays, and we made about four or five ourselves. Um, I wish I had time to do more and, and actually put into practice what I'm observing or what I'm giving other people the opportunity to do, but I think it's really important that we created this ongoing space. Yeah, I, I, and I really want to thank you for it. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back uh, in a second to the selection of the of the makers, and maybe we can also uh, try to narrow down the, the definition of the essays that, that you applied to, to Critics' Choice. But before that happens, because you mentioned that you commissioned some of those works, and there was a little bit of budget behind it, and I wanted to revert back to the question I was asking to Ariel about the professionalization of the practice before, because uh, obviously certain resources can allow you to to become a bit more more professional. 
but I don't think that um, this is such a frequent situation where you can actually find places that uh, offer funding for this kind of works. Like, how does it look uh, from your perspective? And uh, uh, if we could go back to the question that, that um, I asked before. Yeah, uh, no funding. We don't have funding for anything like that. Uh, and in general, I think that people, the academics who work in, in this field do it for free, <laughs> do it because they like doing it because uh, they feel that it a, has a great contribution to what they're exploring and they're not getting any, any certainly not in Israel, any sort of uh, financial, I mean, again, uh, professional YouTubers have Patreons, they have subscriptions, uh, it doesn't work that way, uh, uh, mostly in, in the academic circle. And as for the gap in professional, uh, professionalism, this is actually something that's closing, it's a gap that's closing very uh, uh, quickly. I think if you go back, 10 years ago to when this started to develop as an academic field, you could really feel the difference between a video essay edited by a professional editor and an academic video essay, which maybe was interesting in theoretical arguments, but was very roughly put together. You could really tell the difference. And I think that's not uh, true as much today. Just a few years later, um, there are a lot of very professional feeling uh, academic work. Um, and while I mean it's easier when when you're only editing um, professional materials and not you know it's not it's not a production in most cases there aren't a lot of video essays that um, um, film their own footage unless it's the desktop documentary which is a whole different uh, type of field and even the vlog format that's very uh, popular in YouTube video essays isn't as popular in the academic world. So you're, you're only working with materials that already look good, so you just need to try your best not to ruin them somehow. Um, and even myself as an academic, I've, I've had some of my work screened at festivals here and there, uh, even though this was not like my intention in making them. Um, but I think, again, it's a gap that's not disappearing, but it's not as uh, substantial as it once was. Yeah. We've seen over the years like more and more essays being actually featured in the festivals. This is something we hoped we could talk with Sana a little bit more about. But obviously, forensicness, for example, that we've seen yesterday in the in the essay program that was screened at Fit Marseille and uh, Ihlava. Uh, I think uh, um, Kevin Billy paved the way with Transformers Premake that also got um, um, selected to, to many, many festivals. But I think there is something interesting about the notion of professionalization. I teach essay in a film school. So I teach to film professionals. And that's interesting because their first response often to, to this idea of an attempt is actually withdrawal because they are so obsessed with the notion of profes prof professional production that they are afraid to try and to come up with something that might not look perfect. Um, and sometimes what I find so refreshing about those, those essays is that you see people who do not come from school, so they dare to try, and sometimes we, they come up with something really fantastically experimental and beautiful and, and really well produced, but something that goes, let's say, against the intuitions that you would have that are related to the pro professional production. And there is this process of de-learning, actually, and becoming the amateur again, where you have to allow yourself to, you know, to kind of um, uh, go against the grain a little bit um, with, uh, with the students that I observe from, from film school. I don't know if it's your, your uh, experience as well, Kuba, here in, uh, in Wood Film School, or? Well, I, I, I would say that I totally agree. I mean, that's, if, uh, that's also a question about uh, the way students are taught film directing here at the film school. I don't know if it's the issue that we want to discuss, but basically, I mean, there is, there is a difficulty in teaching experiment. I mean, there are a lot of elements that, f um, uh, that are, that sort of uh, build up the context of, of students' films and have, uh, for some reason, I mean, it's very difficult for them to get out of the box, to get out of their comfort zone and to, 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 to make something that they could risk um, if, uh, that would be a failure, right? But I, I, if, uh, I, if when it comes to video essays, I mean, it's, it's just you know, it's just very few examples, so it's it's it's, it's, it's not there yet. I cannot answer it. Uh, I feel that they feel much more comfortable uh, while doing it, definitely, uh, because I work mainly with film editors, and for, I can tell that quite often uh, the idea of writing a thesis of six. Six, 600 pages, 600, well, 60 pages, 
not yet there, of uh, 60 pages, of, uh, it's overwhelming for them. But at the same time, when I encourage them to, to play with the materials, suddenly, you know, suddenly they deliver very quickly. So, for, but it's too early to tell. Uh, for my intuition is that it, it really works like this, that it allows them to, 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 to feel much more comfortable, although they are, you know, uh, for, for they're taking risks. And I guess that's a question I would like to address also to everyone. Like with Dana commissioning over 50 essays over the years, Ariel uh, working with the students, Yukuba as well, and, and Michal, you also as in the, working in the, yeah, in we the gallery. We didn't ask Michal anything. I mean, yeah, I will, I will get there. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's right there. But I just wanted to address something that is, I think is very important in what you said. It's this notion of failure. Yeah. And in the original manifesto that we wrote for the, for the studio, we said, like, this should be... Uh, this should be a space that allows for failure because yeah. in research like failure is also a source of knowledge yeah. and would you actually say that you yourselves uh, you know like often fail in your practice or like learn from the failures in this process or have you seen other works like by students or you know some people that were failures but they were actually productive failures um, did it ever happen also like with maybe Dana with the essays that you ever commissioned um, you know, we work solely based on trust because there's so little time. So by the time the, in Rotterdam, the program is fixed, we're more or less in December and then mid January, the video essays have to be delivered. So we speak with people about the films and about the selection and we make a mixture of people who have experience in making video essays, but also we really want to invite first timers uh, to experiment. And many times we even haven't seen the video essays before. Well, we've seen them maybe one day before they go on the big screen, say in the Pate One in, in Rotterdam. So we present whatever we get. Um, sometimes people want to discuss something. Sometimes they want to have a bit more of editorial uh, involvement. But it's really an open commission so they can send in whatever they feel is right and um, we present it and then we invite the people to discuss it with us and with the audience and um, most of also with the filmmaker so in a sense we turn the cinema room or the cinema space into a laboratory uh, where we just um, create an option so that can be a failure or a productive failure as well um, but maybe that's also when you give people trust, um, oh, there's always something interesting that comes out. Ariel, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, the notion of failure is interesting. It depends how you define a failure. Like, um, one failure is that I tried to make a certain video essay and I just didn't, it didn't come to fruition somehow. And then perhaps the reasons why it doesn't work is, is illuminative of something that you, perhaps you thought one thing and you discovered that the reality is different and that is productive in, in knowledge production. Another type of failure is I set out to make a video essay that does one thing and eventually it did something else. So my original intention failed, but I ended up with something that's perhaps better or perhaps more, again, true to the materials. Um, I could even speak of my ongoing uh, work as part of the uh, essay film studios is a sort of failure because my original intention was to make, uh, my original intention was to take my, again, my master's dissertation exploring uh, post 9-11 American television series and uh, translate it into either a short film or a series of short, like a web series that's explanatory with a voiceover that's basically the, uh, my argument from the thesis in audiovisual form. And then because of the fragmented nature of the studio sessions, a different guest each time, a different uh, practice each time, a different uh, exercise each, each time, I wound up with fragments that don't link up into a film or a series. And this is, a, again, a failure of my original intention, but I'm, I, I like this fragmented approach a lot better, and it's also suited to my interests. So this is definitely a productive failure in that sense. About my project specifically, you, you, said, you asked in the beginning whether the studio sessions as a whole have worked or not. I think some, for some of the participants, this fragmented approach was frustrating 
and they ended up not getting what they wanted out of the sessions. For me personally, again, it was a productive failure, if you call it that. But that's kind of ev evading the question, because it's a success. It's not, just not a su the, the success you thought you were aiming at. I mean, I recognize it very well because I set off over a decade ago to do a PhD on, on the subject. And then I ended up doing a VR piece and like various video essays and a lot of different productions and workshops and stuff like that. But the PhD never happened. And the clock is ticking. Session. Because it wasn't on the cards. No, but I think we always like to liken this practice and we say it's a different type of epistemology to a, cer to a certain degree. And uh, there is this uh, beautiful text by uh, Willem Flusser. Uh, where he likens the, this to a gesture of making, and he says, think about it that normally, uh, there's something that Felix was talking about as well, like our idea of, of perceiving reality is very much based on the sense of, uh, of uh, seeing, uh, on the gaze. And he says, like, what if we thought about knowing the reality, but through the hand and not through the eye? or for the coordination of eye and hand. And he says, like, if we reach out to know the objects through touch, it res is response. So basically, we actually have a direct feedback. We try to mold that object, and that mold object actually gives us something back. So it's a mode of research, which is you have less command, less mastery of your object, but you also open yourself up for the object to inform uh, what you're doing. So um, I remember th the process also that you went through, and, and you wanted this coherent thing, and suddenly, the work that was about this schizo analysis and this kind of paranoid narratives did not want to be contained in uh, in like just one format. So it was kind of uh, falling apart. So so I think that this is a process that that I very well recognize, and I think it's a it's a huge added value of of, uh, of working in this in this manner. But it's also a danger. It's I mean something you you need to allow yourselves to be informed and to to stray off course as we've been straying during this panel a lot today. Uh, but uh, I wanted to, to actually now um, uh, ask Michal, because we were talking about like all these different uh, circumstances and, and modes of production. Uh, because like in a lot of contexts, like I think in the US, uh, a lot of this essayistic practice came from fandoms, so really from the, from the, um, from the fans that, or from film critics that were actually addressing the media objects that they were working with. That's the same that Dana was just saying about you know, appointing Adrian Martin. But in Poland, we are in a bit of a different situation because if we, if we look at this, let's say, modern tradition of the essayistic, which is about the media objects about media objects, in Poland it comes from uh, actually media art, like video art scene. So that's something that, that you've been working with a lot. So if you kind of could sketch a little bit like that context. Yeah, yeah. When I was looking at the, the charts with the, the circles and these fields, uh, this is um, something which lacks there, I mean, the art world. And I, I've been thinking why. Um, why we don't have like what why or you don't have like submissions like straight from the art world and why you can't like name it that it's from the art world and actually um, like my, my thought is that uh, if they are they're like already through film world like these connections like Rotterdam for example or like some film festivals which are trying to be like consciously connect uh, and build some bridges between the film world and the art world and this is uh, basically something what which I, and I'm trying to do for a while, um, both as a, as a curator of the cinema in the in the art institution. But but I think that with most success, and this is interesting uh, as a as a programmer uh, at the short film festival uh, with the Polish experimental film uh, Polish experimental film competition, and this is one of the tools of. Building these bridges, I guess, because most of the of the submissions we have are from the art world, art schools, art academies, or from the artists. Um, so, like, I think that what do you like? What we are discussing till now, this is like uh, to get back to the um, like the definition of the USA. It's something like some some practices, like various of them, but with this notion uh, and this like conscious notion of being essayistic somehow. Whereas like in the art world, like from decades or like at least uh, kind of like we have this like very similar pra practice uh, without this uh, conscious notions of being essayistic at all. Those are like video arts, so, like these gestures, those gestures uh, were there for a long time but in a very different context. And I think that what we we could discuss and what is like very necessary to discuss are those 
different uh, types of like institutions with this with like their like habituses and like and the ways uh, like for example how artists are being taught and like the how the artwork works and uh, to think about those possible like bridges, uh, bridges and connections that we could build. I mean, like the um, SFM Studio is one of those tools, and I, for me, um, Polish Experimental Film Competition is another tool to build this bridge. And for example, uh, this year we had two films awarded, and both of them were like our video essays, but without this notion of being video essays, uh, because they are like straight from the uh, art world. Um, one of them, uh, which got a special mention, um, which is called uh, "To My Friend's uh, Room, Hotel Monterey." It's basically it's 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 a, it's a film made by Jan Domic, uh, a young artist uh, ar uh, interested in architecture, and he did a film about architect. He connects architecture and film theory, and he built this on the found footage from Chantal Ackerman's Hotel Monterey. But he, like his way of working was like very artistic. Like he did the piece for Warsaw, Warsaw, Warsaw Gallery Weekend, and he f first he filmed something, and then somebody showed him uh, Chantal Ackerman the film, and he was like, "Oh yeah, so she already did it. So actually, I could use it." Uh, so like for me, with this like notion, like and being part of this, like consciously, uh, this is pure video essay. But for him, it was like this one like some things that artists are doing so this is a question of the of the language as well of this um, of these traditions that we are dealing with and the question is like whether do we even need to translate those or not or maybe at some extent and what what tools are we need for because like we could of course think about more tools um, and this is the question of money <laughs> So, because you mentioned that there is uh, the institutional differences, and so what do you think is so different about the conditions in, let's say, art schools, art academies, and the, the, the art world that was so encouraging for this kind of practices that was maybe different? Kuba already spoke a little bit about the pressures of the film production uh, that are difficult to navigate. Uh, so you think it's just, I mean, I don't believe it's just a lack of money. Uh, but but so what 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 are these these conditions you think? Um, yeah, this is something that I mean, like I'm not an artist, like so this is like something that I observe from um, from some distance, but like con consciously as a I'm I, like I'm like my background is like I, I'm from the film world. I like I identify myself as a cinephile, and I wanted to be a film critic. And and when I started to work at the art institution, I started to observe the art world and like how how it reacts. And like so, I was like surprised many years ago, and I worked on that like for years. That artists that they don't have even notion of making films. I mean, like the way they are being taught at school is like this is art, this is video art. This is like one of uh, like many you know means of expressions and uh, when it was i could make a sculpture or i could make a video this is like basically the same and for me it was like oh, oh those are films so yeah we let's screen it at the cinema and put it in the i don't know film festival or something like that so i think that this kind of like freedom which i uh, used to think was was kind of naive maybe but i i think that there is a like huge value in uh, in that way speaking of like professionality in in the f film school which is like the the opposite um so we need to like kind of like embrace this artistic approach i guess to uh, and that <laughs> I think this was, this was one of our goals when we set up the studio to kind of break down these walls. And for, for the working group, we invited people coming from all these um, um, paradigms. So Ariel, who comes from academia, but there's also a Polish visual artist, Jakub Wojnarowski, who's in the group. There's also awarded documentary film filmmakers like Mohamed Reza or, uh, or Mila. Uh, so, so this was the attempt to, to kind of spark a conversation and see if we actually share uh, common interests. Which is interesting because it seems that we do, but there is very strongly embedded uh, sets of expectations as well towards uh, the professionalization of it, formats, uh, you know, like, can, do you agree for something to not adhere to the formats that you're looking for? Uh, and of course, like, then there is kind of a uh, discrepancy between what you make and what is then accepted in the 
in the regular distribution circuits because I mean we know that for example there is still a division between fic fiction and documentary there is still a division between short film and full features which is suddenly creates this huge gap between movies that are over 30 minutes and below one hour which a lot of those essays even shown in the program yesterday are uh, so I think it's a very interesting case uh, so I would like to uh, again address uh, Dana's practice in, in Critics Choice like when you were picking up uh, people that you were appointing to to make those uh, video essays, you had a very broad selection of people. Like you had you had filmmakers like my like Mark Cousins, uh, you had uh, established video essayists like uh, Kevin Billy or or Ariel was there as well. No, not yet. Uh, Catherine Grant, uh, let's say, um, and others, and then newcomers, film critics uh, like Hujo and and others who for whom it was really the, the first time. So what was for you the selection criteria through which you said like, okay, those people are capable or those people I'm interested in appointing as, as those video essayists. And there's also a very interesting example of Bianca Stichter, who's uh, shown uh, the work in progress of uh, three, three uh, minutes lengthening, I think three or four years ago already. And Polish audience could have seen it at Millennium Docs this year. Uh, so yeah, what was your criteria? Um, yeah, it's a little bit like how you edit a, a magazine so you try to connect the right writer to the right film or it's like bringing a program curating a program together where you feel like you need to have a variety of voices um and of course we work with more established names because we also needed to establish the program in itself so that would uh, attract people but it's also working with more established voices because we could learn from them and they could inspire us because they would also um, open up or inf unfold worlds. Um, and yeah, uh, Ariel, I think we should get in touch because <laughs> you're definitely on our list, but we can only do so many uh, per year from five to eight. Um, and for us, it's really important to look for this diversity and inclusion in, in, in voices. And uh, yeah, Bianca is a beautiful example because I've known her for a long time as a colleague at NRC newspaper where I write for. And um, so we thought, okay, she could be an interesting person to ask to do a video essay. And she said, yeah, I'm not so sure if I want to do a video essay about an existing long film, but there's this short footage that I stumbled across because she's also um, a historian. So maybe I can make a longer video essay about a short footage. And they would say, yeah, that's interesting. Actually, to make something from three minutes of material, how can you make 10 minutes? And then when that was finished, and that is actually a very good example of something that at the moment where we presented it was not completely fully accomplished or achieved, but it had a, showed a lot of potential. So then I said, okay, Bianca, you should, definitely make a longer film out of this. So I connected her to a producer um, who could work with that, with her on that. And it has become one of the most uh, successful Dutch uh, found footage documentaries of the last year. I think it by now it's screened at 50 festivals worldwide. Um, so of course that's amazing when something like that happens. But as I said before, it's really about creating um, a, a mix like um, where you have new voices and established voices and also sometimes uh, encourage more established voices to do something that they've never done before. I think Kevin, for instance, uh, had did some great experiments, a video on uh, James Benning's reading where he didn't have access to the footage or Catherine made a, a, a video essay for uh, Fox Lux, which is a, quite a commercial mainstream film. And uh, usually we, in the end, we get access to the footage, but in this case, we didn't. So she decided to focus purely on sound. So imagine having like one of those big multiplex screening rooms in Rotterdam. I think it was really the Pate one. Um, and all of a sudden you start a video essay, but it's just a wide screen and it's just sound. So it's also giving something to an audience, like something they're not really expecting uh, to experience in, in front of a film. But for me, this is like my background as a chief. It's really about opportunity, inviting 
challenging people and at the same time uh, create one work. Uh, so every edition of Critics' Choice is also like an experiment where together we figure out what we were doing that year or what would be the theme or the overall uh, structure of that. I think um, there is this kind of prag pragmatic thing that, that shows up here maybe to address. I was wondering like, how do you think, like how important it was that you were able to offer like a little fee as well or uh, that it was attached because we were, we were talking about this gap also between let's say film financing and then this completely unpaid labor uh, or the labor that is attached to your academic um, uh, advancement that is there and then there seems to be no uh, or very little opportunities where you can get paid uh, or like create this kind of work uh, within its scope, within its uh, modest, uh, let's say, formats and scopes. But uh, what uh, what do you think, Dana? Like, was that a, was that an important factor, or? Yeah, but that also has to do with the fact I've been a freelancer for twenty five years, and I do a lot of stuff for free because I'm crazy. But uh, when I ask other people to work for me because it's work, I want to pay them. So from the beginning, when I was editor in chief at Filmgrant. Um, we just made a point of it to pay people for their work. And uh, so a lot of my work as an editor, but also as a curator over the last uh, whatever, 25 years, and also the work I do for Film Forward now, where I created this residency for uh, people working in audiovisual media, they also, they get a stipend so if for me, it's just like I, I don't ask other people to do something for me without paying them. Um, and that means that a lot of my work deals with uh, applying for funding or finding sponsors. And that can be micro payments and it can be micro sponsoring. But in the end, I just want to offer people something and then I can maybe do it for free and self sponsor and be crazy. But I don't have because I think maybe the situation in academia depends on your on your contract but at least you have some form of a salary but if you don't and most people working as as critics and filmmakers they don't have a salary so i it's just a matter of decency for me to pay them for their work yeah it, it, it's been very interesting for me coming as an outsider also to, to film world that um if you compare it to let's say the 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 media practices in writing it's so different because there, there seems to be like kind of no intermediary solutions. So I had a student uh, last year as well who's a classically educated filmmaker, but what she said at some point, she said, you know, it's very weird because for me, filmmaking is like any other practice, it's like a muscle. So basically you get to practice it, but the problem is that you get to practice it every two or three years when you get funding to get on set and actually engage in working. And she says, and she came to the school and to this master program in, in Film Academy because she said, can I find a way for myself to be engaged in this practice and to train this muscle every single day? Uh, and of course, you can look at this kind of avant-garde practices like, you know, Jonas Mekas or something, you know, where you, where you just make those journals um, all the time. But if we're thinking about the structural, in the structural sense about those practices, it's very interesting because we have this proliferation of screens right now. And it seems that if you're in one field, you just produce for one type of screen. So if you're a filmmaker, you just produce for a cinema screen. Either it's short film or it's a long film. But she was also asking, it's like, how is it that when you're a writer, you publish a book every three or four years, but then you write, like, write essays, write reviews, write articles, you know, like all kinds of media outputs where you can train your, you know, your, your craft, but also re quickly respond to certain things that are going on around you and not, you know, spend four years to, to make this uh, a long response. So I think like that's that's something really to think about, and that was my main one of the, my main concerns when we started this whole uh, journey and moving forward. I really want to also try to think this kind of spaces and places how we can create them. Uh, and I think I wanted to ask, uh, going a little bit outside of the issue of money, but but in terms of organizing and mobilizing the field, um, you've done two very interesting projects lately. Um, uh, one is Once Upon a Screen, which was co-edited with Evelyn uh, Kreutzer, uh, and the other is Steven Dictionary, which is your, uh, your uh, own uh, project, let's say. And this was also a, a kind of uh, an attempt, uh, without building an actual 
place and space, but, but to create circumstances and conditions for the people to get together and engage in this kind of practices of maybe not co-working, but res like a mutual response to a call or a subject. Uh, can you, can you Elaborate a little bit on those two projects. Yeah, sure. That's been uh, some of the most uh, rewarding experience of the past few years, is these collaborative projects. Uh, Once Upon a Screen is a, a collection of video essays that deal videographically with uh, childhood cinematic traumas. So each person chose some film that scarred them as a, as a child and made that into a video essay. Uh, the first volume was nine video essays that was published in 2020 in the Cinephiles Journal. Uh, some very interesting work there. And we are actually right now uh, close to finishing the second volume, which is expanded to 16 uh, video essays. And you can expect that uh, later this year, hopefully. Um, so it's uh, really a communal um, experience of working together with other people. In, in the second volume specifically, we we made it so one person wrote a text about their own experience and then someone else had to make a video based on that text. So it was collaborative in, in more ways than one. So I'm, I'm really proud of that, uh, that project. And the TV dictionary, I started as a fun little uh, summer exercise. It's, uh, the, the premise is um, make a short video that tries to capture the essence of a TV series using one word. You take the dictionary definition of that, of that word and you take clips from the series and you just make that into a video. Uh, so I made a couple of uh, examples and then invited other people to join. And I think we're currently at uh, 51 videos in the dictionary and uh, counting. Uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, it was very uh, warmly embraced by the videographic community at a time of lockdown where there was very little face-to-face -face contact. So these kind of collaborative uh, experiments really uh, foster a sense of uh, community. Uh, it's a good way for people to to hone their craft, as you said, but also for new people to kind of uh, uh, dip their toes in the... If they're, they don't have experience, it's a good way to get started using the support of the community. Um, so you can check out those projects and join in if you'd like. If I'm not mistaken, the latest entries by Jason Mittel, who did... Uh, or by Johannes, who, who made a... Jason, yeah, uh, uh, Jason Mittel, if, if you know him, is one of the key figures in the world of videographic criticism. Uh, we just presented this week, actually, at the Critical Studies Conference, uh, Critical Studies, Television Studies Conference, I'm sorry. Uh, we uh, presented a few entries from the TV Dictionary, and then Jason made an entry about the TV Dictionary. Like, he took the TV Dictionary as a series and made a video about that, so it's a kind of meta reflection on the project, which was uh, fun. We would like to open the floor for questions now, uh, both uh, to people who are uh, watching online. Uh, Michal is tuned in to, to the chat, so like if you actually have any questions, please do ask. And uh, to all the people in the room, obviously, so if you have any questions, please just raise your hands. Oh yeah, there's a question in the back. Hello, uh, Lauren Dubowski, and I have a question. I'm, I'm interested in this, <clears throat> it's kind of going back earlier in the discussion, to you know what counts as a film essay. Um, I'm new to the idea of myself, so thank you for the opportunity to learn about this, this whole world of, of creation and, and research also. Um, but I'm curious, but I could feel myself during the discussion saying, okay, if this is a film essay and not you know, a documentary or, you know, showing the wide range of, of projects and the context in which, in which they're created. But beyond this question of, like, categorization, I'm just curious to hear from everyone, um, or anyone who would like to speak to this, what is uh, valuable about uh, using this term, uh, film essay, in this context, or what's meaningful, or, like, sort of what, in in practice, what does it do to use this term? Well, I guess it's an umbrella term, right? For, it's an umbrella term for different attitudes and different uh, approaches. Uh, and definitely, um, uh, we, we produced some <laughs> more or less defined features of maybe what an essay film is not. Right, and uh, for, but at the same time, uh, the essay, essayistic approach as such, has a long uh, history 
in literature, right? And there were a number of, of attempts of defining what an essay, a uh, literary essay is. And for example, um, this element of heterogeneity and synchronicity and, and the only sort of space that allows for um, such different um, dialectically uh, for, for different elements to be put together and to somehow work, right? And uh, I guess maybe this question of an essay could be turned around and for, uh, I, I would say that for, it's a very similar question to for why do you use the term collage, for example, right? Like, is it, is it any, you know, uh, for obviously we know what collage consists of, but at the same time, for, for maybe we could get uh, for, um, along without it. Um, for, I, I think it's 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 uh, for well we need it <laughs> to, to a certain extent we need it to, to actually delineate uh, for a, a, a field but at the same time uh, and to differentiate this, this field from more traditional fields of uh, fiction filmmaking or documentary filmmaking but at the same time uh, for, it's a term that needs to be constantly revised uh, because an essay uh, and this is one of the features that we sort of uh, for agree, uh, agreed on, uh, for it often works with the context uh, for, and it often works uh, for, in often piggybacks uh, for, as a result on, on something. So for basically, and, and for, for, so, so it basically it depends very much on the, on the context of, for example, media distribution of certain historical moment. And uh, for, um, for, for this reason, it needs to be constantly uh, for redesigned and reinvented, right? Because this context changes, so your involvement with this context changes. Uh, for, um, uh, uh, and as such, I mean, it has to be sort of uh, in uh, constant motion. But at the same time, uh, for, I, I think I, I wouldn't drop it. I think this element, this etymological element of trial, uh, for, of experience, because it's also somewhere there, right? For, uh, experiment, experience, trial, uh, for attempt. I mean, for it's uh, for it's something. It, it's like a, like a direction, maybe, right? Uh, for it's not a definition, but it's like direction that we would like to take our projects. Uh, for, for to, I don't know. If you answered the question. It's a very difficult question, basically, and you tried to answer it for like four years oh, now, and you still don't know the answer. But but basically, we sort of come. We managed to, to, to come up with some ideas. Michal, did you yeah, want to? Yeah, uh, because I've been thinking about that uh, also for, for years, and I have like my the most recent uh, ideas is that really the, the, the term is kind of problematic, as we really have uh, like I in the as I said in the art world I see like video essays, but they without like this conscious uh, conscious notion of being video essays. So I think that we. S we uh, stand uh, likes to repeat that this is not a genre, but it's, but in the way I mean this is, this is something like we talk here about this, we, we, that films we which are rooted in video, videographic film criticism and for example we we haven't talked about um, like contemporary ethnographic film uh, or in this tradition. Um, so for me, this is, but I'm, but I still think that this is super useful tool, uh, mm. like to use this term and like in the way we did it and we are doing at the uh, at the studio, like to like to spotlight this this methods and I think this is, uh, and um, of and course then immediately prob problematize it, right? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. So we yeah. we are like not not naive about that, and uh, of course we need to remember that uh, almost every term in like film theory is problematic, and like to get back to John Grierson, like guy who invented the term documentary, he invented it like in the same sentence uh, he wrote, uh, this is a. a um, clumsy description, but let it stand. Like the moment like the term documentary was invented, it was already problematic. So I think it's like, we need to remember that those terms are problematic. And we had like two weeks ago, the same discussion about uh, what is experimental film now, um, which is also kind of like umbrella, umbrella term for, for almost everything. And I also think that it's super problematic, but uh, and clumsy, but let it stand. And I mean like to, we need to get use of this term, uh, in order to build those bridges and connections between those words and uh, so the like essay film or film essay or video essay or yeah those are like uh, we 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 are aware that they're problematic but we use it con like consciously to in order to achieve something like this is my approach to to that 
Uh, for example, like we spoke with Ariel uh, two days ago about because we, we we both have been in the, in the Bucharest at the conference, and uh, Ariel was like, oh, there was like only one or two panels on on video essay, um, and I was like, yeah, that's true, it's it's a pity. But then I was like, okay, oh, the the whole conference called epistemic media, and uh, the whole conference was kind of about like this epistemic approach to to media. Two years ago, the same conference had Kuba Mikurda and Katrin Grant as, as keynote. So I mean, like this, this. Um, and Mikabal. So yeah. So this uh, essayistic approach kind of lurked and like got into uh, thinking and thinking about this. I don't know epistemic turn. Uh, so our job is. I mean, it it, it wor it, It's working. I mean. <laughs> We don't have to call it video essay, it's working. We could call it epistemic media or like, yeah. I mean, I, I have a definition for my own uh, particular use, but I think what is, for me, what is interesting is that we all, I think we can all count ourselves in, in a way to, as early adapters of, of the format in, in education, in, in all kinds of array of practices. Which is interesting because I was trained as an academic, Kuba was trained as an academic initially, Ariel was uh, trained as an academic. And for me to find myself in this liminal space to suddenly teach in a film school and work in this art context of making and practice, that was a, um, that was emancipatory moment okay. because suddenly I was caught in this conundrum of all the time dealing with those categories and I felt that the stake of my work was actually to clarify the category yeah. and I was ah, that was exhausting I was I was just so fed up with this and suddenly I got engaged with the practices and I'm like oh this is so much pro more productive because I don't have to go back and revert back to this notion of what DSA is I'm just applying it as a method of engaging others with a, on, yeah. in a practice that is a practice of discovery and of of investigation of the, the of the objects that we are really interested in through the through this kind of mediatized means of production. But I, I really like those two classic definitions. At some point, uh, Michel de Montaigne, who is uh, you know historically uh, uh, my French, I don't speak French, so like please uh, pardon my French, but. Um, uh, he said something like, for the lack of my natural memory, I make one of paper. Mm -hmm. So basically he indicated that there is, there is a certain capacity to which he can think things just with his own brain. But then if he wants to think more complex thoughts, he needs a, to engage a medium. And then he takes a pen and paper, and in that process of writing thoughts, he helps himself unravel those thoughts and of course this kind of for me it coincides with this idea of human machine interfaces and you know like becoming a cyborg or something with Donna Haraway where together with our tools we become thinking devices yeah, I mean, it's, it's never been more true than when it comes to editing right I mean editing like yeah machine is like human cyborg right and, and it allows you to think thoughts that you would, would have never been able to think without it yeah, you said it was for you. This was much more physical process, yeah. and I think everybody who's ever edited, like you know, you're you're in this kind of connection with you know, you have everything under your fingers, and then there is a rhythm. There's all kinds of things involved that you respond to, which I think is a, it's for me it's very it's interesting. Almost sensual. Yeah, but uh, there is another definition by uh, Georgi Lukacs that I always uh, uh, like to quote, which he said that essay is thoughts occasioned by. Uh, and I like the simplicity of that definition because it, ca it captures a lot. So first of all, I mean, for me, there's always an object of interest that, of the essay. So you look at something, and for me, then the essay is that where you record the unraveling of the thought. So if, you, if I can say anything about the essayistic, uh, of course, I, I like to avoid the, genre, the generic definition, but that it basically follows the logic of unraveling of thought, of the, of the process. And that is essay as a method, so like as a method of research, but for me what happens when you actually make an essayistic work is that you try to translate this experience to the audience. So basically you invite the spectators to follow the process of research or the process of unraveling of thought together with you, which is very interesting as, a, um, as an artistic question because it doesn't translate one-to-one, -one, something that you, you discovered having certain interfaces at hand and through the process of in, uh, editing and kind of lengthy exposure to the material will not translate the same way if you just show it on screen. So you have to find ways to invite the audience to think with you. So uh, I think some, some people like call it a third space or something. Um, 
So let's let's finish that round. So Ariel, do you have a, your own operational definition? Um, I think uh, most of it's been said. I'll just uh, add a viewing recommendation, a video essay called What Isn't a Video Essay by Grace Lee. That's a terrific video from last year, and I'd recommend to, uh, another perspective on the video essay landscape. Dana, do you have uh, any definition for yourself? I think, yeah, most of it has been said already. For me, it's very much um, an exploration of a thought by all means possible. Um, and um, in the end, for me, when I curate a program, I think the program itself is the video essay where, you, where actually the audience is, is an integral and essential part of this thinking along. So we need that as a discursive method as well. Um, yeah. yeah. I think this is this is very interesting. This is something we've been discussing with Cuba after we received the submission for, for the studio, that this term of essayistic can open up possibilities of thinking different pra practices differently. So we felt like, okay, there is now a friend of ours who is enrolled in this uh, also group on the essay in like performance as an essay, Agnieszka Jakimiak. Uh, like all kinds of people are discovering this term and applying it to their own practices because I think it just unlocks something and you know this this uh, you know the dare to to experiment and and really to acknowledge the medium in which you're working as an epistemological tool um, as well uh, so yeah curatorial uh, practices as as essayistic practices that's I think um, a very important uh, um, and an interesting uh, subject as well. Do we have more questions? Please, yeah, there is a question in the back. Let me add a bit of history. I'm one of the representatives of the film form workshops. My name is Dachosław Twanowski. I always worked with uh, uh, Rifek Iwaszko. So I'm very happy that you are continuing. Uh, today it's called an essay. Uh, we called ourselves the film form workshop, and we were essentially a, a school club or an academic club. Uh, today, you have more means. There has been an evolution in electronics. Back then, the fil film tape was very expensive. We were working on 35 millimeters. So in order to do it all, but also to avoid accusations, we simply said it was a workshop on film forms. And we often staged provocations during our performances. And we would say, OK, the form is here, but where is the, the man? Where is where's the person? Uh, just to rev up the audience a little. And at the film school, school, my colleagues, our colleagues from other studios, referred to us as the mathematicians. And nobody asked us what we were after. Uh, we were neither from the same year, we were neither uh, of the same background. Our paths crossed on Targova at the film school. We applied here in order to make films. But we decided that what was taught here at the time was merely um, translating literary texts into visual language. And to us, that was too little. This was back in the 70s. And already, an evolution was started in terms of equipment. Uh, so you could rewind um, without all the mm, toying with VDCons. So te new technical possibilities emerged. And we decided that a graduate of this school should be have universal uh, capacities, universal skills. So not only turning literary text into film sequences, that was too little. This is why graduates of the cinematography department had an advantage. Kruszczyński uh, narrowed it down to four people. And there were also directors involved in the workshops. The first Oscar for Poland's this was a workaholic, and it was not surprising that he came up with all those things. So at the workshop, we even talked about computer games, which didn't exist in Poland at the time. Andrzej Barański, Marek Kotarski, they all took part in our group. 
in our formal or informal group, um, depending on how you look at it. So this is the second day of the conference, and I'm so happy that you are continuing this in some way. Of course, you have some comfort as academics. You're expected to produce results, predictable results, and films are a commodity, like much like books, like text. That is simply the case. We're not making the films for our own comfort. Uh, but to be shown out there. So if nobody watches the essays, there's no dialogue, nothing comes out of it. So without, mm, just to keep things short, I'm very happy that you are continuing and that you're using the term essay. Essay is a very wide-ranging, capacious word. It's an umbrella term, as you said. Uh, congratulations uh, that you have you're able to procure funding. Um, I don't know what will come of it. Uh, if, if you say in the application form, I don't know what the end result will be. That's impressive that you're, you managed to get funding that way. So congratulations. And I'm a huge fan of yours. And maybe I'll come back to the school and attend the workshops. Thank you. And thank you so much for this voice. And I think there is a continuity in attitudes. And you can actually see those moments and essayistic moments like sparking in history uh, in, in a lot of uh, uh, times. What is interesting is I think this uh, remark by Laura Malvi as well that um, when she was looking back at her own practice and she says like, yeah, they all have their, their own specific media moments. And what you just said about the, the scarcity of, uh, of the means of production. So like, you know, the, the, the film was just more expensive and the access to editing tables was, was, uh, was more scarce. So I think the, this kind of new resurgence of, of video essay right now brings it with it different forms, but it's the same attitude, I, I would say. And of course, before that, in the 50s, we had this whole uh, uh, movement uh, in France, which, which was labeled, I mean, it, it was sparked by this idea of camera stilo, which is the camera as a pen, and literally trying to, uh, to treat the, the camera as a, as a tool of note making. Um, that, of course, uh, Chris Marker, Anis Varda, and, and those left bank uh, um, uh, new wave filmmakers uh, come from this, from this tradition. There is, a, there is a great text as well by Laura Malvi called uh, Death uh, 24 Frames Per Second, where she's actually, and then the, the a pensive spectator, when she's actually describing how, for example, the invention of DVD uh, enabled some of those media practices that, you know, slowing down, you know, and, and uh, the dissection of, of the film that suddenly they enabled different modes of, of viewing. Which is also interesting if you look at the school, at the seminars that Grzegorz Kulikiewicz was running here back in the day, which was unique in its own right because when they were held, now we can all pause and rewind and fast forward. But back then, in order to dig into those films so much as those students in those seminars were, you actually had to have editing tables at your disposal and really like stop the movie and, uh, and do that. So like this kind of close analysis were not done uh, very often. Uh, at the time, so yep, uh, we are all fans of uh, of uh, Warsztat Formy Filmowej. So you know, thank you for for uh, setting up the foundation for for those practices uh, in, in here in school. Uh, there was another question uh, right there. Hello, and thank you for the presentation. And I want to ask quite a tangential question. I think. Uh, Ariel uh, said something about uh, English language being the most commonly used for video essays as something problematic, and I am uh, curious about this, considering that this uh, language becomes universal and also there is a lot of possibility for translations, so I'm curious about this one. Uh, thank you for the question. First of all, just to, to set it straight, it's not necessarily that it's the language that's most commonly being used. It's the, most, uh, it's the language that's most commonly pointed out in the sight and sound poll as a sort of way to keep a beat on what's going on. It's the sort of work that gets the most uh, uh, exposure, I suppose. Um, but then you also have in recent years a few uh, journals like Tech Marine, which is uh, focusing on the Spanish uh, language. Um, uh, video essays, and most of those also offer translation. Um, 
so that there is some interesting work being done uh, that isn't English language but doesn't get as much exposure. Even video essays that are uh, subtitled in English don't get as much exposure as ones that are in English language. I can say that even in, in Israel, most of my students, or a lot of my students, make their own video essays in English, which is great on the one hand. That's great. They can get more exposure outside of the country, but perhaps something gets lost when you, from the start, give up on trying to use your native language and perhaps also addressing your native uh, cinema. A lot of the, the work that my students do isn't about, most of it isn't about Israeli cinema and television, but it's about American or uh, British English-speaking uh, uh, media objects. So in trying to highlight other, other options as well, I think this could, it could be a great way of both highlighting more media objects and creators for more uh, diverse places. So that's what I was... Uh, Okay, thank you. Yeah, just this leads us. Uh, we have like two minutes left, so we can like talk about this. But maybe next panel film could be like geography of uh, video essay, or or film essay, because it's. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 always thinking how how come that in uh, in UK it's so popular. I mean, like this method, like uh, academically, like you could actually make your like uh, you know uh, master thesis as a as a video essay at university and like this whole tradition like there is there and here we have like this on these you know little scrams <laughs> of it and we're trying to build it from the scratch actually uh, whereas in some countries this tradition is like much more developed and how come yeah, I, I, maybe to, to round it up, I want to say two things because we actually had a comment uh, also on ch on the chat on YouTube from one one of the members of the of the essay film studio uh, who was the free listener, and it's a scholar from South Africa, uh, Alet Shun, and uh, she wrote us a message that basically based on you know the, the talks that we had in the seminar, she developed a course uh, about Nollywood, uh, which made her students engage with the. Uh, production practices in Nigeria and South Africa uh, through this essayistic framework. Uh, so I think in terms of like, you know, geographical uh, thing, like uh, I was very happy that we had all these uh, applications from all around the world because I think that enriched our uh, like little circle and, and this, this attempt at, at nailing what the essayistic could be. And I just wanted to respond a little bit to also to that previous uh, statement. I think that the one uh, important thing to to highlight is that there is an audience actually uh, you know that's not a concern uh, the thing is that if we think normally about those screen practices that we produce in school as we said before they are produced for cinema screens and maybe at cinema there is not not so much audience for this kind of essayistic works but there is audience online and the most popular channels on YouTube they have hundreds of thousands of views like you know every frame a painting or uh, yeah, millions even. Uh, uh, Kevin Lee, who made the first uh, video essay blockbuster, I think, with uh, with uh, the Spielberg faces, he broke, I think, six million at some point, and the video was taken down. And now I think all the re-uploads have over a million views. So there is an audience for it, and it's interesting because it is, it is also a viable alternative to to academic practice because scientific article, like let's not fool ourselves, it's being read by 50 people if it's written in Polish, if it's written in English, maybe 200 people around the world, and those essays are being much seen much more than than this. So that just to kind of round it up, uh, going back to those uh, to this uh, sentiment that my student expressed. Uh, about you know filmmakers or like image makers being those people who who really professionally or or as you know as as the kind of out of love engage with with images in their practices, I really imagine this kind of image maker of the future. If we're talking about the future, as someone who is versatile, who can create, uh, who comes from, who can come from whatever field, who can create a movie, uh, you know, every couple of years, but also can produce any other media. Uh, products or media media um, artifacts for different screens and different audiences and also in a kind of a different mode of reaction like you know we were always amazed by Polish theater how quickly for example it reacts to to political issues all around us but uh, film of course is much slower because of the production process but video essay can do that like I mean you can immediately react to, to, to political to social uh, situation using the media and uh, 
we go back to the title of that uh, session today. So the essay as a methodology of, um, of analyzing and researching the, the reality or the media reality around us. And we are done. Um, I would like to thank everyone for, for coming here, for accepting the invitation. Aryo, thanks for, for joining us in person. Dana, thank you so much, uh, you know, despite my own shortcomings today uh, that you, you managed to, to join us. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for being with us, uh, Kuba, Michal. Uh, thank you, and uh, you know, thank you for for uh, you know being on the journey all together, all all, all of you. Um, and we hope that it's, you know in one form or the other we'll get to continue. Let's continue a full lunch break. <laughs>